Hello and welcome to the HamCorp Guide to Applied Energistics in GregTech New Horizons. This is the first of a two-part guide meant for employees who want to fully understand how AE2 works in this modpack, since there are some significant differences compared to normal AE2. This video covers the fundamentals of the mod and how to set up a starter network, and the next video will cover advanced concepts and niche uses. Timestamps are available in the description to divide the video into chapters. The first chapter covers this introduction and my assumptions about your GTNH knowledge. The second chapter covers controllers, cables, and channels, what they are, how they work, and how to manage them. The third chapter covers the various types of components and what they do, along with an overview of the various modifier cards and useful items. The fourth chapter covers storage options and techniques, with a practical example of setting up a simple storage network. The fifth chapter covers autocrafting, both item-based and fluid-based, with a practical example of setting up a basic autocrafting system with fluid support. Essentia-based autocrafting is not covered. First, let me make a note of a few things. The current version of GTNH is 2.8.3. I expect you to know how electricity works and how multi-blocks work, at least at a basic level. And also, a quick disclaimer. A2 in GTNH is massive. There is a lot to cover and it's likely that I am going to miss out on many things. Do read the comment section and pinned comment for more information, and if you know something I left out, leave a comment for your fellow employees to learn from. There's also a wonderful video by Nine, quite similar to the two videos that I'm planning, and I think with the combined information, you should be able to do the vast majority of things with AE2. Let's get right into it. An ME network consists of cables and components. There are three types of cables, glass, covered, and dense covered. Glass cables are the cheapest, and they look kinda bad, but covered cables look a bit nicer at the cost of some rubber. Both allow the transport of up to 8 channels. Dense cables allow transport of up to 32 channels. We'll talk about what channels are shortly. The covered and dense covered cables also have smart variants, which are more expensive, they use circuits, but they show you how many channels are flowing through them. I don't recommend using them exclusively, but they are nice for a quick, clean visualization, particularly at junctions. You can paint cables with spray cans, and cables of different colors will not connect. All cables will connect to Fluix colored cables though, and in addition, if you need to prevent the connection of cables, you can also use cable anchors. If you want to hide your cables, use facades, though they still allow connections through them. And finally, avoid loops. AE2 can be a little silly with its network structure calculation, and this can lead to some hard to troubleshoot weirdness, so avoid loops. To construct an ME controller, the brain of your network, simply craft one and place it down. Powering the controller is as simple as connecting a generator's output to the controller. This does waste an entire face of the controller, so a better way is to use an energy acceptor. This energy acceptor can be anywhere on your network. I recommend putting it close to your power generation. In addition, I recommend putting energy cells, or better yet, dense energy cells, to buffer some energy in your network. Pushing items as part of your future auto-crafting is going to cause a spike in energy usage, and with a large enough request, it can shut down your system temporarily if you don't have a large enough buffer. Now, each face of the controller supplies up to 32 channels. You can connect more controllers to the first one to make a larger controller multi-block, and the rules for whether or not the configuration is valid it's not really that important, but the main point is that you cannot have a row of controllers longer than 7 in length in any one direction, and that you cannot have any plus shapes within the structure. If the controller has an invalid configuration, it will turn red. Note that each network can only have one controller. Components like interfaces, export buses, storage buses, etc. are placed on the cables. Each component requires one channel to operate. You know it's working if it says device online on Wayla. Without an ME controller, you can have up to 8 channels on a network. With an ME controller, you can have as many as you want. Technically there is an upper limit, but it's so high that it's basically irrelevant when managed well. A proper method of handling channel transport will be covered in the next video about subnets, so keep an eye out for that. Types of components and cards, oh boy there's a lot. I'm only going to cover the things I found myself using often. This is not an exhaustive list, that would simply take too much time and have too much kind of useless information. 
Refer to the quest book or feel free to ask questions in the Hamcorp Discord or in the official GTNH one. Alright, let's break this chapter down into three parts. Components, modifier cards, and finally useful items. Components are devices that require channels to operate on an AE2 network. Some components allow the pass-through of channels, typically the components that are full blocks. The cover-like components don't. Here are the components in-game. ME chests and ME drives. These are containers for your storage cells, which hold all of your items and fluids. Storage will be covered in the next chapter. Terminals. There are a lot of different terminals. The most important ones are the crafting terminal, fluid terminal, interface terminal, fluid pattern terminal, and fluid processing pattern terminal. Level emitters. These components emit a redstone signal based on the number of items or amount of fluid stored in the network. You can also leave the emitter unfiltered to trigger on any item. Interfaces and dual interfaces. This is quite literally an interface of the network. You can push items into it to send them to the network storage. You can pull items out if they're stocked in the interface. And the interface is capable of performing auto crafting by use of patterns. More on this in the upcoming chapters. Interfaces can be set to various blocking modes, which allow or disallow the push of items based on the contents of the receiving inventory. Storage buses. Storage buses mark the connected inventory as a valid storage location for the system. They do not actively pull or push items or fluids. Note that the connected inventory can be the interface of another network, and this is a subnet, and this will be covered in detail in the next video. Export and import buses. These components push or pull items or fluids from the connected inventory. The name export or import is relative to the AE system. Exporting means pushing items out of the AE system, and import means pulling them into the AE system. P2P tunnels. Point-to-point, -point, not peer-to-peer, -peer, tunnels are a way to teleport something from one end to another. This something can be items, fluids, redstone signals, light levels, patterns, or even channels. This is very, very important and will be covered in significantly more detail in the following subnet video. Molecular Assemblers and the Large Molecular Assembler These are AE2's auto-crafting solution to crafting table recipes. The LMA is a Grectech multi-block version of the MA, Level Maintainers. These blocks allow you to set up maintainer requests. Your auto-crafting system will try to maintain a certain number of the configured items in your system, automatically requesting more if you run low. MEIO ports. These blocks allow you to rapidly transfer the contents of a network to and from a storage cell. This is very useful for automation challenges and is very, very fast. ME output buses and hatches. These components are equivalent to output buses and hatches for multi blocks, but they interface directly with the AE network. They can cache a small amount of items or fluids by default, and you can increase the cache size by using storage cells. You can also partition cells in a cell workbench to filter the output bus or hatch. Cached items are only cached because they don't have a valid place to be stored. And cached items cannot directly be seen by the AE network. So if you see that items are cached in one of your output buses, that means that your system is not able to store those items for some reason. Stocking input buses and hatches. These components are placed in place of input buses or hatches, allowing you to configure up to 16 items or fluids from your network which will then be exposed to the multi-block. For example, if you have 10,000 iron dust and you stock iron dust in a multi-smelter, the multi-smelter will be able to see all 10,000 iron dust at once. Advanced stocking input buses and hatches. These components act like the regular stocking hatches, but they have an auto-pull feature. Auto-pull pulls the first 16 items it sees in your network. Be very careful with this. Typically, you only want to use autopull on subnets where you have precise control over what kinds of items exist on the network. Or processing is a good use case. Autopulling your main net into a macerator would be pretty depressing. Crafting input buses, buffers, and proxies. Cribs, as they are often called, are amazing. They replace input buses and allow you to store patterns inside of them. When you make an auto crafting request, the system sends the items to the crib to be cached and processed. The crib bus is not capable of handling fluids, and the crib buffer is. Proxies allow you to parallelize one crib infinitely. Simply place a proxy on another machine, link them, and both machines will be able to see the cached contents of the first crib. Proxies, by the way, do not require channels. 
All the GregTech-like ME components can be right-clicked with a wire cutter to allow pass-through of channels on all sides, instead of just the front. Whew, that's all the components. Now, the cards. All modifier cards show a list of compatible components in their tooltips. Acceleration, Hyper Acceleration, and Superluminal cards. These are used to speed up the transfer or processing rate of the component that they are placed in. Advanced Blocking cards. Exposes the entirety of a subnet's contents to the connected interface, for other interfaces to base their blocking logic on. This sounds a bit abstract, and it is, and it will be covered in more detail in the next video. Capacity cards. These increase the number of available filterable slots on components. Crafting cards. Do not use these. The last time I used them, they caused the AE components they were placed in to despawn randomly. Besides, they're worse than level maintainers anyway, just don't use these. Equal distribution cards. Allows a storage cell to partition itself with equal allocations for its various partitions. Fake crafting cards. These allow an autocraft to complete without the final item being returned. This is useful for various niche use cases. Inverter cards. This inverts the function of the component. White lists become black lists, etc. Or dictionary filter cards. These allow you to type in a string of characters, which is then used to filter based on the or dictionary names of items. The specific pattern matching method is called globbing. Pattern capacity cards. These allow you to place more patterns in an interface, up to a maximum of 36 patterns per interface. Sticky cards. These mark the component or storage cell as sticky, meaning the items that are filtered to be stored there can only be stored there. If you have multiple sticky destinations, they are all considered valid. It sort of acts like a whitelist. Within this list of sticky locations, priority works as usual. Overflow void cards. Pretty self-explanatory. Voids overflow. And finally, useful items. There are quite a few. The Universal Wireless Terminal. Allows you to wirelessly access your network, given you have ME wireless access points around your base. The Quartz Cutting Knife allows you to rename any AE component on the fly. The memory card and advanced memory card allows you to link P2Ps, V-relays, etc. The advanced version has a user interface. Priority card. This allows you to quickly set a series of incremented priorities. Read the questbook for details. Fluid discretizers. These allow you to encode patterns with fluids. You only need one discretizer on your network. It seems to secretly treat fluids as items, which has applications for some niche automations. The wireless connector, wireless connector hub, and the wireless setup kits. These allow you to have wireless connections instead of long lines of cable. Be aware that this costs more energy than an equivalent number of cables. The quantum bridge allows you to transport your AE network across dimensions. This also costs extra energy. The cell workbench allows you to filter storage cells and place modifier cards in them. Network Visualization Tool. This allows you to visualize your ME network. It's very handy, but it can be a bit hard to use for extensive networks. The Pattern Optimization Matrix. This allows you to multiply out patterns to reduce the time taken for AE to calculate the entire crafting tree. You don't really need this until the late game. One of the primary uses of AE2 is centralized storage. You can use storage buses and place them on chests or tanks to make the items or fluids in them visible to your network, but it's generally better to just digitize everything. To make a simple, fully digital storage network, you require ME chests or ME drives. In these drives, you place storage cells. That's it. Now you can store fluids and items in your network. But we can do better. Currently, there is no protection from overflow. If you have a passive processing generating, say, carbon dust, eventually your drives will fill up and you will run out of storage. To deal with this, we can partition one of the cells to carbon dust and give it a sticky card. Now carbon dust can only go into the cell and this cell can only accept carbon dust. Once the cell is full, your carbon production system will back up. Now, broadly speaking, a good storage system consists of two parts, a filtered section and an unfiltered section. The filtered section is your bulk storage, items or fluids that you know you will be producing mass quantities of. This part of your network should have filtered, sticky block storage containers. Block containers, by the way, can only contain one type of item, but they are much cheaper than an equivalent regular cell that has been partitioned to one item. Depending on the process, 
you may need some overflow protection and the overflow void card is one of many options here. The unfiltered section is for all the random other items you will end up amassing. Intermediate products like gears, rods, circuits, random magic fetch quest items, random garbage from around the game, all of that stuff. One thing I want to say for fluid storage though, I recommend having filtered fluid storage cells or multi-fluid storage cells with equal distribution cards for all your fluids, even the ones you don't expect to mass produce. Fluid cells store at most 5 types, while item cells store at most 63 types. So fluid storage tends to clog much more easily. So I find that it's better to just not have an unfiltered fluid section. I also want to say that while the setup I've described is good to start with, it's far from perfect. It's generally better to divide up your storage network into subnets to keep things organized for yourself. Bulk storage goes into one subnet, fluid storage goes into one subnet, random storage goes into one subnet, and so on. The next video will cover subnets in detail. So, you now have a working AE system with storage. How can you teach your system to craft items? You are going to need crafting storage and optionally crafting co-processing units. The crafting storage is a cache that keeps all the items that are used in a request, and its size determines the largest request that can be processed. The co-processing units allow your system to push items into multiple locations at the same time for auto-crafting. It simply parallelizes the input of items into machines, nothing more. I recommend making multiple crafting units so you can queue up multiple requests simultaneously. Add a fluid discretizer to your network to be able to request recipes that use fluids in their inputs. Now, once the brains of your auto crafting are in place, you can encode recipes in a pattern terminal. An encoded pattern without any fluids is blue. Note that a correctly encoded fluid pattern is purple. So if you encode a pattern with fluids and you receive a blue pattern, something has gone wrong somewhere in your encoding. So consider a setup like this one. I have an HV assembling machine. I have the output pointing into this interface, which is the same interface where my pattern is going to go. I've already placed my pattern for an EV machine hull. This is a fluid pattern, which means it needs to be in a dual interface, or else you're going to get a weird artifact like this one. If you right click a single block machine with a screwdriver, you can allow input from output side, which allows items to enter from the output side. And now you can make a request. So let's say I want 10 EV machine hulls. I can start with follow, which gives me a little ping when the craft is done. While this happens, I would also like to mention that in an interface terminal, you can see the machine and put patterns in here remotely. Now, as you heard just a second ago, the craft was done and it took six seconds, which is pretty nice. And turning on follow is what gave me that notification. And to be honest, that's it. It can be a bit more complex, of course. For example, how would you automate a large chemical reactor that requires both item and fluid inputs? We will cover this in the next video as my preferred solution requires a simple subnet. And there we go, that's the basics. There are many, many improvements to make in my simple examples and lots more information that I just couldn't cover. At the end of video number one, this one, you should be able to set up a very simple storage and auto crafting network. This network is not going to scale very well, and to fix that, we will make use of subnets. A follow up video will be out as soon as possible. After that, you should have a handle of subnetting as well. And from that point, there's still much more to learn, but I hope that you will have a strong enough grasp of the fundamentals that you can figure it out yourself with trial and error. I hope this was helpful, and I hope you learned something, and I will see you next time.